to uh, to Jennifer. All right, thank you, Jessica. Really appreciate the invitation to be here, and I love hearing about the Treasure Valley Pollinator Project. And just want to say that my pet also seems to know when Zoom meetings are on and decides to bark at everything during that period of time. I'm really, really happy to be here today to talk about the beetles and focus in on, on their greatest hits today. Um, just a little bit of background. I'm with the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. We're a nonprofit conservation organization and we work to protect invertebrates in their habitat. We've been around about 50 years and we approach conservation through education and outreach, through um, partnering with researchers, to doing direct habitat restoration, community science projects, and more. Um, we work in all sorts of different landscapes to protect invertebrates. Our main office is in Portland, Oregon, and we have remote staff from around the country. I'm a remote staff. I'm based in Nebraska, but have done work in Idaho. That's my, that's my connection to Idaho today. And Xerces works to protect invertebrates and insects in particular because they're really the little things that are running the world in so many ways. They play absolutely critical roles to our ecosystems. And although when many people think of insects, they think of pests, those insects that cause direct harm to people or indirect harm by injuring crops or causing structural damage, those pests are just a small fraction of the overall insect biodiversity. Less than 2% of insect species are actually pests. The rest are really important to food webs or directly important to, um, to people. And today we're talking about beetles in particular. Beetles are insects. They have three main body regions. They have head, thorax, and abdomen. They have one pair of antenna. You can see it really nicely in the Firefly here, they have six legs and they have two pairs of wings. And beetles are in the order Coleoptera. That name comes from Greek definition of sheath wings. And that's really apt because beetles have this hardened four wing cover that kind of shields their body in so many different ways. So their first pair of wings are hardened and thickened. And then their delicate wings that they use for flying are intricate, they're really intricately folded underneath. So um, the way one entomologist describes, is, describes it is that they're equipped to go from being a tank to an airplane. Um, so beetles also come in all sorts of different colors, shapes, and sizes. They can be very tiny, <laughs> less than one millimeter, so very, very small or quite large, about 20 centimeters. So if you were to, com to compare that range in sizes um, in mammals, it would be like comparing the tiniest shrew, just a few inches in size to the largest um, whale species out there. So it, there's a really huge size range in beetles. And beetles um, have four different life stages because Beetles have exoskeletons like all other insects on the outside of their body. As they grow, they have to shed that exoskeleton and then um, regrow it as they gain in size. Um, but beetles also go through complete metamorphosis. So their life stages look very different from each other. They typically occur in different habitats and often um, eat different things. So it starts out with an egg which is laid usually near their food source. And then they grow into a larva. The larva eats their food source and then transforms into the pupa. The pupa is usually a stationary stage. And during then the body tissues rearrange and then the beetle emerges as an adult. And beetles have these armored bodies, as I mentioned. They also have chewing mouth parts and specialized appendages that help them to detect their food sources and other things around them. And these features really help them to occupy a huge range of habitats. You can find them on sandy beaches, you can find them in fresh water, you can find them in sand hills, to woodlands, 
agricultural crops to your backyard, to parks. They're found on every single continent. Um, they're a hugely diverse group of animals. Um, there's about 4,000 species known to science currently. And to put that in perspective, that's about a quarter of all known animal species. All animals on the planet, 25% of them are beetles. <laughs> and we're still discovering species every year. There could be a species in your backyard that hasn't been described yet. Um, so many people think that beetles are the most diverse group of animals. Um, but there are fly biologists out there and parasitic wasps biologists out there that I think those groups might edge out beetles. So only time will tell. Um, but you may have already heard this, this whip from um, evolutionary biologist JBS Haldane, who, who quipped that if there was a divine being that had created all living organisms, it was clear that that creator had an inordinate fondness for beetles. So they're just hugely diverse animals. And they have their own intrinsic value um, that's unrelated to their usefulness to humans, but they have also been valued through history by humans um, because they inspire a great deal of wonder. They're, they're beautiful in a lot of different ways. Um, or they have, humans have attached cultural significance or religious or symbolic significance to some groups. For example, the ancient Egyptians really ascribed a lot of symbolic significance to scarab beetles. Charles Darwin was hugely interested in beetles and he tells a story in his autobiography about how he was digging in a log for beetles and had two rare species, one in each hand. He saw a third and he felt like he needed to get it. So he popped one in his mouth <laughs> and reached for the other rare species and the beetle in his mouth ejected a burning liquid, which is just a defense mechanism. So he had to spit out the beetle and he lost the third in the process. So many people throughout history have been really fascinated by beetles. And even in our modern times, we're still learning from beetles. Firefly lanterns, for example, have um, inspired improvements in LED lights and beetle exoskeletons are inspiring structural engineers. So they've really been impactful to humans throughout history. Um, but I'm focusing in today on their ecological roles. Um, they play important roles in ecosystems as herbivores, predators, pollinators, and decomposers. I'm gonna start with the herbivores. These are beetles that eat plants and all sorts of different plant materials. Some beetles are host specific, so they feed on just a single species of plant or closely related plants, and others are much more broad and feed across plant families. Um, but feeding by herbivores helps to keep plants in check and becoming overabundant in plant communities. And in turn, beetles are important food sources for wildlife. So in this picture, you can see a beetle larva that's being fed to a young bird. And 89% of birds rely on insects to feed their young. It's a really important food source. And not just for birds, but also other arthropods, amphibians, and mammals eat beetles regularly. So some of the herbivores um, that I'm gonna talk about today are three main groups of herbivores. And the first are weevils. Weevils is a, a very diverse group of beetles. There's about 60,000 species worldwide. That's more species of weevils on the planet than there are vertebrates. So um, it's really um, hard to conceive. And weevils are really easy to recognize because they have this long elongated snout that you can see. And at the very end of the snout are their mandibles, those chewing appendages that they use. And weevils have the ability to bore into hard surfaces like nuts and seeds and fruits and other plant parts and roots sometimes so they can get to the softer tissues. So the adults eat through some of those hard tissues and then their larvae develop inside plants, typically in the roots and shoots. And some weevils can be really serious pests of fiber and food. Um, the bull weevil, for example, which feeds on buds of cotton is a historically damaging species that's been responsible for a lot of pesticide use. Um, but the majority of weevils are really innocuous. Um, some actually 
eat noxious weeds. So, um, so it's, they are notorious, but also many of them innocent. Leaf beetles, um, this is a, the group in the family Chrysomelidae, and this family is also hugely diverse, and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and colors. So you see some really brightly metallic species here, but there are also some that are really dull and small. Um, these are plant feeders. The adults eat leaves, typically, um, and the larvae tend to eat buds or shoots or roots. And um, some of these species are generalists, but some focus in on, on just eating a couple of key plants. So for example, cottonwood trees can host the whole life cycle of the cottonwood leaf beetle. Um, they will just eat on that plant for its whole life cycle. This group also includes a few plant, um, or a few species that are pests on plants. Um, the Colorado potato beetle is one <laughs> notorious member, and um, there, and the spotted cucumber beetle is another. Uh, there are also species that have been introduced by accident that have become pests in North America, even though they come from other continents. Another really um, common herbivorous group of beetles are scarab beetles. These adults are really have oval bodies. They have clubbed antenna and they have scalloped legs. And their larvae have that grub shape, shaped like a C. They're usually big and white and squishy. And larvae feed on roots, usually in grasses. Um, some feed on lawns, Japanese beetles, for example. Um, or the adults eat stems or flowers or leaves. So they're out and about flying around and their grubs are underground usually. And some are really familiar like the, the green June beetle you might have seen before. Usually it, uh, when I was a kid, they were pretty prolific and they would bang on the screen at night because they were attracted to the light. Um, but again, Japanese beetles is a, another example of a scarab beetle. That's an introduced species that's become a really problematic pest. Our next group of beetles are predators, and these are the beetles that hunt and eat other insects, sometimes herbivorous beetles. <laughs> and um, this is a really nice quote from Robert Metcalf, um, the single greatest factor in preventing insects for overwhelming the world is the internecine warfare, which they carry out amongst themselves. Predators help keep other populations of animals in check. And predatory beetles, some of the groups that we talk about, are really important contributors to conservation biological control, helping to control pest insects on crops. And the value of that pest control is somewhere between four to $12 billion every year in the US. So they are significant and um, their role as predators in crops in particular is important, as well as in wider ecosystems. Um, so the first group of predators to talk about are lady beetles. This is a really familiar group kids and it's been familiar throughout human history even in the middle ages lady beetles got their name because farmers recognized when lady beetles were in their field they had better crops and they referred to them our lady beetle um so lady beetles have a round convex body usually they're red as adults and the larvae look like i keep thinking of them as looking like little alligators to some degree they scuttle around on plants and they've got spikes on their back. Both the adult and the larva are predatory and um, many lady beetles have preferred prey. So they target aphids or they target mealybugs or white flies or scales. Um, and the females lay their eggs amongst their prey. So if there's an aphid colony, for example, the female adult just gets right in there and lays her eggs in there. So when they hatch, the larva are right, they can just go nuts. Um, with, with their food source. The females, adult females also eat pollen or drink nectar and pollen in particular is an important protein source that helps her develop eggs. So they need habitat that's in addition to prey. Um, they can't necessarily rely on a crop for just pest sources alone. They need flowering plant habitat because that will provide them with the protein they need to, to be able to reproduce. And they also overwinter as adults in protected places. So under vegetation or leaf litter. 
So some form of permanent habitat is important for this group. That's also true for soldier beetles. Um, this is another group that contributes to crop pest control. The larvae are predatory also. There, you can see the picture of them there eating insect eggs. And they will eat small insects, but they will also eat other <laughs> large invertebrates like snails and slugs. The adults have leathery wing covers. So rather than being really hard, they're, they're more leathery and soft and um, are oftentimes found on flowers because they also drink nectar or sometimes eat pollen as well. And soldier beetles resemble this next group too, fireflies. Fireflies also have a leathery wing cover as adults. Um, the main difference between these soldier beetles on site is that fireflies have luminous um, or luminescent organs that they use uh, to attract their mates by flashing patterns. The larvae also have luminescent organs and segments and the larvae are the predatory life stage. They're exceptionally good hunters. They're found in the soil and under leaf litter, sometimes under bark. They will search earthworm burrows. They will follow the slime trails left by slugs. Uh, they're really good at tracking down prey. Now, of course, I mentioned that their fireflies are really best known for their bioluminescent flashes that they use for courtship displays. Not all adults have these bioluminescent flashes, um, but those that do um, are really well known from people of all ages and very well beloved. Uh, it's a very charismatic group. Another group of predators are tiger beetles. Tiger beetles have really large mm -hmm. eyes. If you've ever seen tiger beetles move, um, they use those eyes to move fast away from <laughs> danger. So they're really hard to, to capture. They can be dull metallic or bright, like the green um, tiger beetle that you see here. They are among the fastest running insects on the planet. <clears throat> they're super fast as adults. And they're predators both as adults and as larvae. The larvae pictured here um, are sit and wait predators. They attach themselves to the side of a burrow and they wait with their jaws at the top of the burrow for prey to come along. And then they'll snatch and pull their prey into the burrow. Um, and they do do a lot of digging as larvae and they're long lived for two or three years to mature. So um, they do move a lot of earth around. Our next predator group are ground beetles. These are beetles that are pretty dull in color. They're usually brown or black and they have ridged wing colors, covers. They live in the soil as larvae, usually in leaf litters. And then the adults can be found hunting in the soil or hunting on plants. And they have a huge variety of prey. They'll eat caterpillars, they'll eat herbivorous beetles, they'll eat grasshoppers. They'll eat slugs, snails, and more. So they're a really important group of predator predators and can be really important in crop pest control. And some also eat weed seeds and detritus also. They play a number of important ecological roles. <clears throat> and this group overwinters in grass clumps. So while they don't really rely on pollen and nectar as an alternative food source, they do need some sort of permanent habitat Side from a crop field so that they can survive through the winter. <clears throat> um, rove beetles live everywhere that ground beetles do really and respond to similar conservation measures. Rove beetles have very similar prey also. Um, these beetles are a little bit more uh, careful. I think they run a little bit more fast. They're a little bit more aware than ground beetles. So You'll often see them raising the tip of the abdomen as they run. And they are pretty easily to recognize too because they have really short wing covers. So you can often see their flying wings stick out from behind and you can see their the end of their abdomen stick out too. And some, some will live deeper in the soil and eat and scavenge and eat dead plant material or animal material. So it's a, this is another very diverse group with a number of ecological roles. And the last group of predators I wanted to mention were the aquatic beetles. 
These are beetles that live their whole lives in the water, uh, in fresh water, that is. Um, so you can find them in ponds or lakes or rivers or streams. They have these oval bodies that are really streamlined and they are really fast swimmers. Again, can be hard to catch. Um, most are, are predatory eating aquatic insects or aquatic invertebrates. And you can see in the picture there, the bubble coming off the back end. These beetles breathe air. So they come to the surface, they grab a bubble of air and they store it usually under their wings. They trap it so that they can use that air to breathe over time and then pop back up to the surface when they need to. All right, um, I'm now gonna touch on, on decomposers. These are beetles that can consume dead plant material or animal tissues. Um, there's also a huge group of insect of beetles that um, feed or live in fungi, which I'm not um, touching on today as much, but this group of beetles are really important for decomposition. They break down tissues and consume um, tissues that lead to the recycling of nutrients in ecosystems and their work helps to facilitate bacteria and other microorganisms that further break down tissues. Um, so this is in a, a group of beetles that are important to soil health in particular. Um, and the first group I wanted to mention are dung beetles. These are um, also in the family Scarabidae. So they're scarab beetles, they have that oval body, they have scalloped legs, clubbed antenna, and their larvae are also C-shaped, um, but rather than feeding on plant roots, they live within dung and um, feed on dung and break it down. Uh, beetles are really good at finding dung straight away, and they're really important at removing dung. Um, in fact, they're absolutely critical on rangelands for improving the palatability of, of forage plants for cattle. Um, they also reduce parasitic flies that are harmful to livestock, like screwworm or hornworm. Those are um, flies that develop in dung. So by removing dung, dung beetles um, limit those parasitic flies populations. They also disrupt the feeding cycle of flies that carry E. coli. So that reduces foodborne pathogen spread on farms as well. So altogether, they play a really important ecological role in agricultural systems. It's really worth millions and millions of dollars by um, breaking down dung. And there are three different strategies that dung beetles use for breaking down dung, um, three different ways they lay eggs and dung. The first way is just to lay eggs wherever the dung lays. And usually those dung beetle larvae develop pretty fast and um, try to eat as much dung as they can before other things come in to eat the dung. There are also dung beetles that dig a tunnel underneath the dung pat and then pull the dung down to feed their larva over time within a nest. And then there's this third group that, um, that roll the dung. You can see these two dung beetles here have made a really nice ball and they're pushing it along and they're gonna take it back to their nest. So. They, they, they find this ball of dung, they create this, or they find the dung, they create this ball, and then they have to orient themselves and take it back to their nest to feed their young. But it's a great way to secure a good source of dung. Um, and dung is a very hot commodity. <laughs> a lot of things like to eat dung. So uh, that's one really amazing strategy that they use. And dung beetles use um, polarized light from the sun to help them figure out how to move how to orient within the landscape, like how to get from dung back to their nest. And at nighttime, they can use celestial cues like moonlight or even the Milky Way. So these are some pretty smart critters. Um, burying beetles feed on carrion. Um, there's two types of beetles that feed on carrion. Uh, carrion beetles down below here have black and yellow bodies and these beetles lay eggs directly on the carrion wherever it lies. So they might, they tend to feed on um, larger animals or the, they eat the carrion of larger animals. And um, those beetle larvae will also 
eat small beetles or um, small flies that are also on the carrion. <laughs> Um, so they are a little bit predatory too. Burying beetles on top here, colorful orange and black, actually will uh, bury the carrion first. So they try to save some for themselves and they can, they'll move it if they need to, but usually they'll just dig underneath so that the body sinks down. So they don't usually feed on larger mammals or larger or large birds. It's usually smaller animals, small mammals, small birds. Um, and they'll dig underneath, the carcass will come down and then they provide a lot of care for their young. So they cover up the carcass and then they, they actually break down the carrion and feed their young decomposing carrion bit by bit. So they put in a lot of effort to take care of their young. And the decomposition work that these beetles do is really important because carrion um, returns a ton of nutri nutrients to the soil. So it can increase soil fertility uh, significantly and that influences plants. There are also a number of other beetle groups that are involved in decomposition of various sorts. So um, the black beetle here is um, a best beetle, also known as patent leather beetle. This is a beetle that breaks down rotting wood and lives in, in rotting logs and uh, creates a nest. And also unusually provides care for their young. And so the most beetles don't meet their offspring at all, but best beetles meet their offspring, take care of their offspring and actually communicate with their offspring. Um, the other beetle pictured here is uh, a domestid or a skin or carpet beetle. These beetles feed off of tissues on skeletons, for example, or stored products. Um, there's also hide beetles that eat old feathers or fur, skin or hair, things that are really keratin rich. So um, there are lots of little things out there taking care of cleaning up um, all sorts of different tissues. On the next group I wanna talk about are pollinators. Um, more than 85% of the flowering plants in the world require an animal to move pollen between flowers so that that plant can reproduce to produce seeds and fruits. Um, pollinators are really key to healthy ecosystems because they support plant communities and diverse plant communities and all the wildlife that depend upon those plants. Um, and of course, they also contribute to our agricultural food systems and beetles are one of um, a number of really important insect groups that visit and pollinate flowers. And I've mentioned a couple of these beetles that visit flowers to drink pollen, ne drink nectar and eat pollen. Already I mentioned, for example, that fireflies drink nectar and that soldier beetles will eat nectar and pollen uh, and that some scarab beetles will, will eat pollen um, or flowers. Uh, but there are also beetles like this checkered beetle here and longhorn beetles whose larvae are um, found in dead wood and bore through dead wood, but the adults drink, drink nectar found on flowers. So there are a lot of beetles out there visiting flowers and some like the soldier beetle pictured here, that's a goldenrod beetle and um, have been found to to transfer pollen significantly enough to, to be an important pollinator on some different plants. But most beetles are actually not considered to be highly effective pollinators, uh, especially those that are eating flower parts. They're considered to be really messy pollinators. Um, so really more pollination studies are needed to understand the role of, of most beetles. <clears throat> so this is, um, the last five to 10 years have been really um, producing important research that's demonstrating that a lot of different terrestrial and aquatic insect populations are experiencing some declines, not just in North America, but around the world. And it started out <clears throat> maybe 15 years ago with some murmurs and some anecdotes about people that noticed as they were driving that long distances that they didn't need to stop and clear their windshield um, because they weren't hitting as many bugs. There just weren't as many insects in the landscape. And this was 
turned the windshield effect, that there were just fewer and fewer insects on these windshields. But these anecdotes have been backed up by an increasing number of studies that have shown uh, declines in insects around the world. Um, for example, there was a study from protected natural areas in Germany that had um, sampled multiple times over the course of 30 years and had found that over the course of 30 years, insect biomass had declined by 70%. So a huge, huge difference in biomass. And um, we don't have as much data for beetles, for example. Um, it's um, suspected that about a third of tiger beetle species are sufficiently rare enough to be considered threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. And it's suspected that fireflies are experiencing some declines as well as native lady beetle species. Um, but the data data is pretty patchy because most insects are not carefully monitored. Um, but where studies occur, data points to a rapid ongoing decline of insect populations around the world. And we definitely need greater investment in science and understanding these trends. Um, but it's also our belief that the severity of these declines uh, means that we need to take action now to support insects. Some of the drivers of insect declines are land use changes, so loss of habitat due to suburban development or agricultural intensification. Um, certainly invasive plant species are changing habitat quality for a lot of different insects. Um, invasive plants just don't host as many native insects. Uh, climate change is exacerbating all these factors. Um, pesticide use is harmful to non-target um, insects. Um, so a lot of our spaces are really becoming less and less welcoming to um, insects, beneficial insects. So where do we go from here? Well, um, there's a growing body of research that really shows the connection between habitat and insect communities. Um, habitat is really key to restoring insect diversity. If you build it, insects will come. Um, habitat can help bring back species of beetles and biomass and abundance, and it can help them be more resilient in the face of climate change and also more resilient in the face of some other pressures like insecticides. <clears throat> so it's really important to conserve the existing habitat, existing natural areas, for example, but we also need to restore habitat in other landscapes, um, on farms, on roadsides and utility corridors, parks, yards, basically all these places that we, that we live and work. And um, habitat can, can occur in, at many different scales, but wherever you're working, whether it's with space on your balcony or whether you have acres and acres of farmland, there are three main components of habitat for beetles. They need sources of food, and as we just ran through, of course, those sources of food are very diverse, could be all sorts of different things. But they also need some place to shelter and overwinter. Um, so protection in the upper soil layer, a leaf litter, bunch, crap, bunch grass, some sort of permanent habitat that isn't going to disappear um, between seasons. That's healthy habitat. Um, diverse plants, permanent habitat. And if you've got that to keep it healthy, you really also need to protect it from pesticides. So just a couple of quick examples of habitat. Um, these are two photos from Idaho farms. Um, there's a couple of different types of permanent habitat that you can install on farms. Maybe grassy field borders or um, the farm on the right has, you'll see it has the start of a windbreak around the perimeter of trees but it also has a line of shrubs um, along the edges of their fields. Those shrubs provide um, sources of pollen and nectar, and they also provide permanent, permanent shelter in the wintertime. So habitat on farms isn't just valuable to beetles, though it's valuable to all sorts of other beneficial insects, other pollinators, but it also can do other services for the farm, like 
sequester carbon or help water infiltrate the soil better. Um, it can help beautify the farm. It can help be habitat for larger animals. Um, so there, there's lots of benefits for arm fawn habitat. And there is one type of um, habitat feature that's designed specifically for beetles on farms. And these are beetle banks. Um, this is just a long raised bank that goes actually not on the perimeter of a field, but directly through a farm field. And it can be fairly narrow, five, 10, 15 feet in width um, and runs the length of the field, it can be slightly raised and planted with bunch grasses, native bunch grasses. And this is overwintering habitat for ground beetles, but also rove beetles and some other predatory species. And, and the idea is that ground beetles will move from the cropland into the beetle banks in the winter time. And then in the spring, um, there's been studies that demonstrate that ground beetles are able to move quickly into the crop from the ground from the beetle bank and uh, means they can find and hunt for prey much quicker in the spring. And um, in some cases, the investment that you can put into this beetle bank can come back in the form of this crop pest control. But habitat can be useful in smaller scales at home too. This is a home in Boise also. Um, this planting, um, the, the person who did this planting, she put a lot of thought and care into selecting plants that were water wise, recognizing that that's just really important in her part of Idaho. And she also selected plants that were attractive to pollinators and other species. So we're, whatever the scale you're looking at, some important considerations for selecting plants to support beetles include prioritizing native plants um, because that supports more species of native beetles. Um, some herbivorous beetles, um, you'll remember, only eat certain plants. So they need those, those species. You can also maximize um, plant diversity whenever possible. So have things blooming throughout the growing season that can support species like lady beetles, which emerge in the spring as adults and are really hungry and need pollen and nectar early on to provide them with energy. Um, and then also all the beetles that are around throughout the growing season. And then beetles also need other plants too. So um, shrubs and trees are really important and grasses as well uh, for overwintering and shelter. It's really important when you can to avoid double flowered hybrids and cultivars. Those are often bred for showiness and they might not produce pollen and nectar. Um, so it's good to prioritize straight natives whenever you can over native cultivars. All right, so thinking about shelter, um, overwintering habitat for some beetles is in the soil. For example, um, ground beetles um, are impacted by tillage because their larvae can sometimes be found in the soil. So um, reducing tillage whenever possible is really helpful or rotating tillage from field to field. So not every single area is tilled every single year. If you're working in a cropland setting, um, reducing or targeting your use of plastic mulch so that it, you're not covering the soil in a huge area. That's important as well. Uh, it can be important to leave the leaves. This is overwintering habitat for beetles that overwinter as adults or for some larvae too. They live in that, that leaf litter layer. And um, that doesn't mean that you need to leave your leaves on your lawn. You can scoop them up and put them in small areas. So for example, underneath a tree or underneath shrubs. And that can be habitat for beetles, but also for butterflies, moths, and a lot of other beneficial species. Uh, you can also leave a log in your yard. Um, logs can be home to a lot of cool different beetles. And it doesn't mean that you have to leave it in a visible area. This is a, an example of a log that's hidden behind a garden. So you can't really see it from the street, um, but it, it is habitat for a lot of cool little critters. So once you've got this habitat, it's important to think about the repercussions that that, that might impact it. And um, pesticides, particularly insecticides, have some repercussions for, for all the organisms beyond the pests. So a lot of insecticides are broad spectrum, 
they kill pests, but they also kill all sorts of other insects out in the landscape. And sometimes that can have unintended consequences. For beetles, for example, there are a lot of beetles that have longer life cycles. Um, ground beetles live several years, tiger beetles live several years. Um, some lady beetles only have one generation of growing season. So if they get killed or knocked back due to insecticides, their populations can take a long time to recover. Um, so they can have longer lasting impacts on beneficial beetles than on pests, insecticides. And then insecticides can also lead to secondary outbreaks, which is when you have a pest that was previously being suppressed by um, a beneficial species that gets killed by an insecticide. Um, suddenly, without that, that pressure of control, the pest breaks out. So just a quick example of that is um, ground beetles are predators of slugs. And in soybeans, um, oftentimes there's a seed coating insecticide that's used. Slugs don't care about insecticides because they're mollusks, so they don't have repercussions. But the beetles that eat the slugs do and they'll die, they're exposed to the, the systemic insecticide. And when they die, then the slugs go wild. And suddenly, you know, slugs became a problem when previously they weren't a problem. So um, using insecticides in the context of integrated pest management is really critical to applying them only when, when they're absolutely needed because your pest population has reached this economic threshold. And in the context of reducing other things that favor pests, um, you can reduce risk to non-target insects by selecting your product carefully if, if there's any way to target that product towards the pest, um, that's important. Also, you can target applications by treating just the pests, not applying it throughout the system. Um, avoid applying things to flowers that will reduce exposure to non-target beetles and other beneficial insects. Uh, and you can also reduce movement making sure there's less drift, you're applying it under proper weather conditions or using application techniques to keep it on target. One last um, threat that's very unique to beetles is uh, light pollution, although it, it does impact other insects too, to be clear, but, um, but light pollution is, is something that impacts beetles because it causes them to move away from habitat that's lit. Um, or it, it draws them to artificial light, which can be a hazard, or it changes the way they mate. Maybe they run out of time to do courtships or it disrupts the courtship communication. So um, light pollution is a problem in a lot of in a lot of the United States. So there are some steps that you can take. You can use lighting at night only when it's necessary. Um, where it's necessary and when it's necessary. So maybe using it on a timer so that it drops, it drops off at certain times of night, or it pops on only when there's motion. Um, there's also ways to use dimmer lights or light that's filtered by red, which is part of the spectrum that insects don't see. So they're not attracted to it and doesn't disrupt. So that's, a, that's just a new important consideration. All right, so um, beetles need help. And this is the first beetles pun I put in here. So I thought that was some restraint. Um, beetles need help, and we need we can help by restoring the habitat in our communities and um, and and wherever we can live. Um, that means increasing biodiversity wherever we can, and we can share plants with our neighbors or um, within communities. We can put up signs so people understand what that habitat is for. Working in schools or other systems to really spread the word about how important animals are, beetles and other insects, they're so critical. Um, you can also get involved in community science efforts. There's, um, Xerces has a new firefly atlas. Um, there are no fireflies of conservation concern in Idaho currently, just like there aren't where I live in Nebraska, but the firefly atlas has a really nice filterable checklist of firefly species. It helps you to generate a list of what does occur in your area, which is really amazing. So you can use that and enjoy looking for them. Or if you are on the call today and you live in some of these areas where um, there are imperiled species where we need more data, um, 
your your work and your involvement can really make a difference to firefly conservation. <clears throat> Cersei's has some resources um, related to the beetles that we've talked about today and all sorts of other animals too. Um, we have books available. Um, we also have a number of resources that are that you can download as PDFs, or if you'd like paper copies, order a couple paper copies. And all of our work is possible because we are a donor-driven organization and the donors support everything that we do. So um, please consider becoming a donor to Xerxes today. Um, and my final thoughts are, that I wanna leave you with are that beetles really matter. They have a huge influence on our lives. They're really important for nutrient cycling. They contribute to soil health. They're important in controlling populations of other organisms, including many pests. Um, they're good pollinators. They're a source for food for a lot of different animals. And they've been inspiration for humans in various cultures. So hopefully this is a snapshot of some of the amazing beetle life out there in the world. And then my last final thought is that what you do in your space is really important. Um, the plant diversity that you add to your landscape has direct benefits to your, to your space and can influence the space around you too because um, supporting bees and butterflies and beetles and other insects in your landscape benefits the whole landscape. Um, but broader than just your landscape, it's also part of this larger effort to reverse insect decline. So um, what you do is important. And thanks again to Jessica for the invitation to the Ada Soil and Water Conservation District and the Treasure Valley Pollinator Project for the invitation to be here today. I'm really glad I could be here and I really appreciate everyone um, understanding when I needed to reschedule back in June with my um, family member that was ill and needed care. So thanks, thanks for that. And if we have a couple minutes, um, I can take questions. Or if not, also you can um, send me questions in my email there. Yeah, we have several questions in the chat and I think you answered a lot of them throughout your presentation. So we'll just pick out a few and sorry if there are some that I missed that the chat's been really hopping today. Um, we have one question that is the different antenna shapes. Uh, does the shape for each species um, provide a different advantage? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, and there are definitely, yes, is the short answer. <laughs> um, but, and I, that'd be a really neat um, topic. Uh, but there are some that have really feathery antenna and um, are used to really detect, it's thought to detect pheromones for mating. Um, but of course, antenna can do lots of other things too. So, um, antenna can be a, a diagnostic characteristic for some beetles. And they definitely come in some wild shapes that I didn't even showcase today. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, we have one question here. What are the best resources for identifying beetles? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, your your normal uh, field guide, like, um, the Peterson's Guide to the Insects of North America, which is just a little field guide. That's a great way to get to the family level for a lot of different beetles. And um, that can tell you a lot about their biology because a lot of the thing, the groups that I talked about today, it was all at the family level. So that that's a good way to narrow it down because it's such beetles are so diverse. That's a good place to start. But there is also a book called The Beetles of Eastern North America. Um, um, and I forgot his last name already. Shoot, sorry, his first name is Arthur. I can look it up and um, find it, but it's a great, it's a great uh, book for identification. And I don't know if there's a comparable guide to the West. Um, so I'll need, I need to look that up too. Um, but that's a good place to start. I think your field guide, your basic Peterson field guide is, is a really helpful for family level beetle identification. Awesome. Um, and then we have a question that is, what are some ways to investigate the diversity of beetles at your home or a certain area without harming them? Yeah. Uh, specifically good. pairing with educational programs. Oh, super question. Um, Cersei has a couple monitoring resources and um, 
I can, I'm probably not going to be great at multitasking, but uh, in a second, I will try to find those links and pull those up. But um, you can use a couple of different tools. And some of these are outlined in the soil life guide um, on our website. But one way to start is just take a sweep net and sweep flowers and look at the beetles that you get off of that. You can just put them in a jar and you can chill them to kind of calm them down so that they're not super anxious and you can get a long, a longer look at them. And then you just let them warm up and fly away. So that's one really good way to look at them. Although really a lot of the beetles on flowers are not moving very fast, so you can just watch them. Um, you can also dig in the soil and, or you could create something that's called a pitfall trap where you dig a hole in the ground and you stick a cup, like a plastic cup or a jar so that you bury it so that it's the opening is at the soil level. So they're just do, 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 fall in the trap. And some people make them um, permanent traps by putting alcohol in the bottom. So you capture and kill, but you don't have to do that. You can just leave them out there um, and check them frequently um, to see what's in the bottom because some of them can then fly out, of course. Um, uh, so that's one way to get looking at insect uh, life that doesn't that doesn't have to kill them. Or you can, for things that are on vegetation, you can put um, like a clipboard with a white piece of paper underneath foliage and shake the foliage onto the paper. And then again, have somebody with jars to help capture it all and chill it and then look at it. Awesome. Um, one question, uh, is rove beetle predatory? Yes, rove, rove beetles are mostly predators, but they also, there are also species of rove beetles that are decomposers, that are scavengers. Um, so they, they have a wide range of palette. <laughs> awesome. Um, let's see. And then there's one last one, um, about the aerial spraying in public rangelands in Oregon to control the Mormon crickets. Um, and she is just wondering if Xerxes is involved or aware of this. Um, it looks like BLM is doing some spraying for the crickets, but the concern is that the decomposer beetles are also then being targeted on this rangeland. Yeah, I have a colleague, um, Sharon Silvaggio, who is um, working on um, aerial spraying. So I can refer you to her. Um, I can get you her email address if you'd like to talk with her directly. Because I'm not familiar with Eastern Oregon spraying and Mormon cr cricket issues in that area, but I do know that Sharon is trying to understand more about the potential insects of those insecticides to um, the potential impacts of those insecticides on non-target um, animals. So um, just a quick note about dung beetles too, that um, one thing that does impact dung beetles is the systemic insecticides that can be used to, to suppress pests of cattle. So sometimes they're, they're poured on the bodies of cattle because screw worms are horrible <laughs> for cattle. So they need some sort of protection um, but the insecticide could then appear in the dung and then it, it uh, impacts dung beetles. So yeah, it's just, it can be a really complicated system figuring out how to target some of these insecticides properly to the pests. It sounds like it. Um, I think we are out of time for today. If there is a question that I missed, um, it sounds like you'll be able to follow up with Jennifer after the meeting. Uh, this will also be um, posted. We recorded the presentation and it should be up on our YouTube in a couple of weeks at least. And we will email that link out to everybody. Um, and it also sounds like the Xerxes Society has tons of great resources on their website. So I would highly recommend to um, visit their website, check them out, and then reach out to Jennifer if you're having a hard time finding uh, what you need a connection to. And if anybody has questions about the Treasure Valley Pollinator Project, maybe how you can um, start one in your community or um, 
just how to be involved with us, uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, we would love to help spread this um, anywhere <laughs> we can. Um, we really believe in supporting insect habitats since we see such a huge value in their contributions to soil health and plant health. And thank you guys so much for joining us today. We really appreciate all of your time. Thank you. Thank you.